Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for thechessworld.com. Welcome to another course. This time we'll focus on calculation, decision making, middle game strategy. So what I'll do is I'll show you games and I'll share my thinking process. Hopefully this is useful to you. So without further ado, let's dive in. For the introduction, the game we'll look at is Ragusin against Noskov. It is a short game, but I think it works well for an intro. So let's see what we got. Uh, white plays e4. We're not going to focus too much in the opening. We'll see the decision making process. Uh, black plays e6. Here we got the Paulson Sicilian d4 takes, knight takes d4, black plays knight f6. And here we've got the first um, surprise by white. Instead of playing knight c3, which is the main move, white plays knight to d2. Now, it is worth noting that e5 here loses a pawn to queen a5 check. So, e5 is not recommended, of course. Knight d2... It is a subline, and usually I tend to develop my pieces towards the center. Now that I play knight d2, we see that our knight on d4 isn't protected, so black should play something like knight c6 that's attacking our knight on d4. And here, unless we want to move our knight back, and that's not a great idea, we would be losing an opening tempi as white so unless we want to do that we have to take on c6 and here black has two retakes and to be fair both are fine usually it's recommended to take with a side pawn towards the center so b takes c6 followed by d5 and it's fair to say black is equalizing here. Not only he brings a side pawn towards the center, he also gets the open file for the rook. So overall, I'd say the position is balanced. Now in the game after knight d2, black plays in a standard Sicilian way, playing d6, stopping e5. So after d6, white keeps on getting its uh, pieces out, black plays knight c6, he could have uh, played knight c6 before, now white takes, pawn takes, notice that here black uh, he still brings a side pawn towards the center, however if he's playing d5 at some point he's doing so in two steps. He already played d6 and now if he ever plays d5 he's gonna essentially waste a move so or a tempi I should say so I think here black he probably has to change the strategy perhaps not playing d5 and playing something else instead so here white castles fair enough that's <laughs> the most natural move. I don't really see any other useful move for white better than castling kingside. So here black plays bishop to e7. So as a general rule I think in the opening we have to stick to the fundamentals. Here black cannot afford doing something weird like g6. Development is key in the opening, so if black plays something like this, trying to you know play bishop g7 and castle kingside, it might end up <laughs> badly for him after knight c4. Now we'll continue with bishop f4. He's not in time to play something like bishop g7. Even if he does, then we can play bishop f4. We'll easily punish him for delaying its kingside development 
I mean, he gets e5, okay. And now after e5, his bishop on g7 is uh, on a closed diagonal, not to mention d6, still uh, a weakness. So here I think we've got the uh, first uh, key concept to mention. I know this line for black is not the greatest, but it shows us a nice uh, middle game, or I should say positional example. Here we play bishop f4, we attack the pawn on d6, and it feels like uh, after e5, black's the one getting the initiative. That's not right, because he does play e5, but on the other hand, he's uh, sort of uh, limiting himself uh, in future. His chances later on are not as good as uh, if his pawn was still on e6. With that pawn e5, we were more than happy to waste a move by playing bishop f4 and now moving our bishop back. But we achieved something, and that is uh, blockading his bishop on g7. On top of that, now that we mentioned bishop d2 here, we still got several ways to attack that pawn on d6, so we still keep a solid advantage as white. So, just to summarize, don't be afraid to play moves like bishop f4, or, in other words, don't be afraid to waste a tempi moving your bishop twice, if that means your opponent is going to create weaknesses. So, bishop f4, e5, that's fine, we move our bishop back. Another example would be bishop g5. Here, if he goes h6, we're not going to take, because we don't want to give the bishop bear away. I mean, unless we win a pawn or something. So here he goes h6, fine, we move our bishop back, and again, he keeps on creating weaknesses. It might not feel that way now, but later on in the game, trust me, those weaknesses will be targets for us to attack. So. That's, I, I think, uh, a key concept to mention. Right, so castles, black, uh, keeps it simple by playing uh, bishop e7. And here is where, as white, we have to think of how to develop our pieces. Usually, we want to attack on the king side, that's what happens in the Sicilian defense. We of course have to think about where to place our queen, but I'm also concerned as white about bishop c1. I have to find a good square for my bishop, or even better, I should find a diagonal. So should we get our bishop out towards the king side, or should I play something like b3 and bishop b2? I feel that b3 and bishop b2 is better because from b2 my bishop will be controlling the center. And then if we think about bishop b2 and bishop d3 as a team, then I've got two diagonals attacking black skin side. So I feel b3 is a no-brainer. Now, the other bonus to playing, uh, the, other, the other benefit to playing b3 and bishop b2 is that I can also consider f4. And with f4, I might play e5, f5. So it all makes sense. If I play something like bishop b3 and bishop f4, my bishop there is not attacking much, and it will be more difficult for white to get a lot of space on the king side. So b3 is with white place, it makes a lot of sense, black castles, white plays bishop b2, and here black plays knight to d7. Okay, so now I know we are analyzing this game from white's point of view, but let's think about this position from black's point of view as well. What can black play here? His position is solid. 
it's uh, I don't see many weaknesses for, for black if any I mean perhaps that pawn a7 could be a potential target in an endgame that pawn is not connected to other pawns so that's the only thing I can mention about uh, black's position in terms of uh, potential weaknesses but other than that black is completely fine um, now what should black play it's not an easy call because um, usually when you consider pawn moves in the opening you're creating weaknesses as well uh, let me explain with uh, real examples let's say black plays i don't know g6 well at some point in future that diagonal might be a weakness for black. The same goes if he plays h6. Doesn't feel like uh, this diagonal is going to be a weakness, but at some point in the game, let's say we go c4, I can even play, I'll just play random moves here, but I, I want to show you what could happen. Now, because he played h6, one day we'll go e5, and we'll try checkmating him on h7. Now if he goes g6 in order to stop our plan, then that pawn on h6 is a weakness. If he had the pawn on h7, then black has better chances to stop our attack. So each pawn move we play, we have to think twice about it because as we know pawns, they can't go back, so we have to be careful not to create weaknesses. So I'm sure Black thought about playing something like d5, which is a standard move in structures like this one. The first drawback for Black here is that he already played d6 and now he's playing d5 in two steps. So that's uh, one thing uh, to consider. Uh, on top of that, White could play e5 removing black's kingside defender. We know knight of six is uh, the best kingside defender because it protects the kingside, it stops moves like queen g4 and queen h5. So knight of six, if we can kick that knight out of f6, that's interesting. Uh, there's a trade-off as well because if we go e5, now our bishop on b2 is on a closed diagonal Bishop d3 happens to be on an open diagonal now. So, as we mentioned before, every pawn move has uh, pluses and drawbacks. So after d5, maybe we can delay e5 a little bit, and we can play something like rook to e1, queen e2, we keep on getting our pieces out, and then when we're ready, we'll play e5 and uh, continue our Kingside attack. So one more thing before I, uh, before we continue with the game, here I feel if we're gonna move something, say queen e2 or rook e1, I feel rook e1 is more flexible because I might play queen f3 later on. If I play queen e2 then that means I'll probably play something like f4 and that's why I would keep my rook on f1. So sometimes it is a matter of taste. It's not easy to, to tell which move is better because both are fine. So let's see here how the game continues. Um, Black, as I mentioned, played a knight d7. And before we move on with the game, there's one more concept I would like to mention before I forget. Think about it. Black, at some point, he wants to play d5. Most of his pawns are on light squares. In so many openings, we got this concept of Black having a passive bishop on c8. Usually, bishop c8 for Black is a passive bishop. In the French, Karokan, Sicilian, as you can see here. Uh, on the other hand, bishop e7 is uh, 
better. Uh, it's usually easier for black to find good diagonals for that uh, dark square's bishop. For bishop c8 is not easy. Even if he goes bishop b7, that bishop usually is on a closed diagonal. So if we think about this, black could play something like a5. Again, a pawn move. So what does black achieve after a5? Well, for starters, he'll play a4 if allowed, thus getting rid of uh, that weak pawn on a7. He also creates uh, a lot of play on the queen side, so a5 and a4 is it looks interesting for black, to say the least. Now, if we stop it, if we play a4, then black can also consider playing something like bishop a6. And this is a good trade for black, because he gets rid of his bad bishop on c8. On top of that, he goes for a good trade. I mean, bishop d3 is an attacker. We could potentially checkmate him with bishop d3, so if you think about it, this is a great trade for black. So, in the game, black plays knight d7. Speaking of <laughs> trades and bishop trades, black, we can smell, we can sniff bishop f6 here already. He wants to trade some pieces off, and that's going to help him towards equality. So after knight d7, here white plays f4, which is a natural move. And here black um, plays what I think is uh, the first mistake in the game. So far, he could have played better. His position is solid, has still still got decent chances. He plays bishop f6. And now bishop f6 doesn't look like a mistake, but we'll see why um, it is not accurate. Now black doesn't have too many defenders on the king side, he just played knight e7, so the king side defender is gone. I feel black has to play something like knight c5, that would make a lot of sense. Knight e7, knight c5, his strategy makes sense. And of course, he'll go after the bishop pair. So knight c5, he'll take the bishop on d3. And then, he still has some issues on the king side, because at some point we can play, even here, we can play queen g4, perhaps rook f3, rook lift would be great in order to attack uh, black's king side. But at least black gets to remove one of white's attackers. So that's why knight c5 is the right move, in my opinion. So here black uh, plays bishop to f6. So this is the key position I wanted to uh, reach, reach in this game. After bishop f6, we've got uh, a key <laughs> decision as white. What should we play after bishop f6? He's attacking our bishop on b2. Um, we've got so many moves to consider. We could trade bishops off. We can try stopping the trade by playing something like c3. We can also protect our bishop. Queen c1, rook b1. Here's where we have to be precise, because af after all, in chess, everything comes to decision making. So, what should we do after bishop f6? What we can do here, I suggest you stop the video, you pause the video, you take your time, imagine this is a tournament game, and go for a move for white, decide what you would play as white in a tournament. Then you can compare your analysis with uh, the video. So I'll do a 5-10 seconds pause and then I'll continue talking.
Okay, so after bishop f6, um, I'll try sharing my thinking process. Let's see. The first move that comes to mind is bishop takes f6. It's uh, an easy reaction. We trade bishops off. It's like I take on f6 and then I think about the next move. So after bishop takes, now you can play both knight takes or even queen takes. And it feels like he's got some uh, domination on dark squares. It's not the end of the world for us because we don't really have uh, weaknesses. Our bishop on d3 is protected. We can just keep on getting our pieces out and it's more or less balanced. We might be even better as white, but it feels like trading is helping black because now he'll play knight c5. Again, he's got some checks. He's got control over um, dark squares. So this is okay for us. So we will still consider bishop takes f6 as an option. We've got to look for something better, because we might have something better than that. In uh, this variation, by the way, um, we are left with uh, bishop d3, which is decent, but it's not the greatest bishop. We know this bishop, at the moment, is not, uh, is not great. It's okay. So, bishop takes f6 is an option. We'll leave it there. We might come back to it. What else can we play? Rook b1, I mean, this is not a great move. It's, it might be equal. It's It resembles the other line. I mean, he might play queen f6. Our rook on b2 is just a target. We'll play rook b1. Even if black doesn't attack our rook, we're going to come back to b1 soon. So, unless it's the only move, I wouldn't consider rook b1. For that matter, I would play... Queen c1, because after bishop takes, at least I've got a queen on b2. I can always reposition, relocate my queen to a better square. But again, it doesn't feel right. I mean, that queen on b2 is not doing much. I feel my queen belongs to the king side. So little by little, we are... We are removing lines, we're doing a process of elimination. So, rook b1, queen c1, unlikely to happen. So far, bishop takes f6, seems to be the top candidate move. Uh, if we protect the bishop on b2, there's one more move, which is knight c4. But again, that resembles rook b1 and queen c1. We don't really want to end up with a minor piece on b2 or rook and queen for that matter we don't want a piece on b2 so is there any other move to consider we're not gonna sacrifice this change we're not gonna play something like bishop a3 that doesn't look right at all anything else i know you're probably thinking about e5 i mean that's uh, of all of the moves we mentioned so far, e5 is the only one we haven't analyzed yet. And I know e5, it looks like white's losing a pawn. Sometimes, even if we lose a pawn here, if we get initiative in return, that it might be worth considering. So e5 is what white plays in the game it is the right move let's see why for starters we attack the bishop on f6 so that means we've got the initiative we keep both bishops bishop b2 is still in the game bishop d3 is uh, quite dangerous at the moment we might have sacrifices on h6 on h7 sorry we'll see so Without calculating much, we already know e5 might be a great move for us. So that's how grandmasters think. At least that's the way I think. <laughs> so e5, first move from white. Now black is going to take. 
what else? I mean, if he goes back, I can take on d6, and he's just moving his bishop around. Uh, so he'll take. And here, here's where we get uh, a lot of possibilities. And over the years, I got used to not retaking on the spot. Like, when you analyze a game, you see pawn takes and then you automatically automatically play pawn takes back. Take your time and see if you can play something else just in case. Here, for instance, uh, pawn takes e5 is worth considering, but we might have something else. We might have rook to f3, going for kingside attack, maybe queen h5, queen f3, knight e4, which is the move white plays in the game. We might have f5, who knows? Just get used to seeing uh, each position as a new one. When you see takes takes, perhaps retaking is not the right way to go. Because, I mean, I've been so used to analyzing like pawn takes, pawn takes, without even thinking about other moves. So that's a fatal mistake. Uh, so after pawn takes, now let's uh, analyze uh, moves. Taking on e5, it's uh, interesting, of course. Now, the issue here is that black can simply take. If he goes back to e7, then, well, we might have some tricks. It's also fair to say that now that we've got a pawn on e5, our bishop on b2 is technically a bad bishop. I don't really see how bishop b2 is going to help with uh, our king side attack. So, not really sure about f takes e5. Not to mention bishop takes e5 is possible. Now, we can think of some tactics here, like bishop takes, knight takes. Now, if queen h5, then he can take on d3, stopping the checkmate. If we take first, king takes, queen h5. This is a trick that happens all the time. King here, we do get the piece back. Do we? No, we don't. He takes on d2 at the end, and we are down a piece. So, here... We are trading too much, and we are also losing material at the end. So, taking on e5, it might work as a pawn sacrifice, maybe. But if you're going to sacrifice a pawn, there's no need to take on e5. There's no need to activate black's pieces. So, what white did in this game is great, which is e5, and after pawn takes, knight e4. So... The pawn sacrifice is based on intuition, and now we see every minor piece is playing. We've got everything ready for kingside attack. And I also like the fact we'll probably take the bishop on f6. We'll have the bishop pair, and we know how powerful the bishop pair is in an open position. So here... If I were black, I would probably play bishop e7, because I can feel white is already firing with bishop b2, bishop d3, knight e4, queen h5, rook f3. White's <laughs> moves are all over the place, and black has to keep that powerful bishop on f6. In the game, black takes on f4, which uh, is a natural move, but now we take, we want to keep both bishops alive, of course. Knight takes f6. Rook takes f4. And I think white's position speaks for itself. Two powerful bishops. We've got uh, open lines on the king side. And black still underdeveloped with that bishop on c8. Passive position for him too. So here... Yeah, I would say black's losing already. It, it sounds like too much, but trust me, I don't see... <laughs> I don't know what to play, because 
We can tell that bishop takes f6 is a threat. We would be destroying black's uh, pawn structure. So bishop takes, or even rook takes f6, removing black's uh, last kingside defender. So if black realizes taking on f6 is a threat, he has to move that knight somewhere. But if he does that, let's say he goes knight d7 or knight d5, then here we don't even have to calculate much based on intuition. If we follow the fundamentals, we know he's got no pieces on the king side, so a sacrifice is likely to work. What about a check as well, just to make sure he's got only moves. King takes, queen h5, king here, and now we have to follow up with a power play. Rook here seems right. Then he might play f6 and the king runs away. What about doing something else? We sacrifice on h7, now queen h5, we bring a piece in. What about playing bishop takes? We keep on sacrificing, we keep on removing his kingside defenders. We removed that knight from f6, now we make sure pawns are gone as well. Now we've got so many threats, he has to take rook g4. And after king f6, it's game over with queen g5. So, as you can see, this was a piece of cake for white. And, of course, you can calculate all this. But based on what we saw so far, on based on concepts, we know these sacrifices are guaranteed to work. Because we've got so many attacking pieces and black has no defenders. So... Black um, cannot really move that knight away from f6. In the game, Black decides to play rook to e8. But here, um, for starters, we can play bishop takes f6, destroying Black's uh, kingside pawn structure. However, White finds an even better move, which is rook takes f6, and now we'll see the difference. Pawn takes queen g4 check, again, white goes for force line, black plays king f8, now king h8, I mean, playing that move when your opponent's got a bishop on b2, that's <laughs> risky to say the least, here, the other issue with playing king h8 is that black won't be able to play f5 because f6 is pinned, so queen e4 wins, no way for black to stop queen h7. The same goes for queen h4. We attack the pawn f6 and the pawn h7. So after queen g4 check, black plays king f8. Now the bishop joins the attack via a3. Rook e7, whoops, sorry, not queen e7, rook e7. Okay, this is resignable for black, of course. Not only his uh, down material-wise, uh, his uh, pieces are stuck on the queen side, and his he'll be checkmated soon. Queen b6, last check before resigning. King to e8, black desperately tries running away. But here we go, rook d1. What a classy way to finish this game. We develop a piece, we cut his king off, we don't really bother taking on e7 because that rook is uh, not doing anything. And we'll play queen g8 checkmate next. So here black resigns and <laughs> we, we've we got our first chapter. Um, as I said be, before we started analyzing this game, I feel this game works well as an intro because uh, we've got so many concepts to analyze and a lot of uh, decisions as well, not only from White's point of view, but also from Black's. So hopefully this works well as a warm-up and in the next uh, chapter onwards we'll continue analyzing um, more and more concepts. So hope you found this useful, hope you could learn something and of course I want to see you guys in the next chapter. Thank you.